Welcome back to This Week in Immigration. I'm Jordan Lapierre. On the program this week, our new survey, Americans say they want the government focused on health and the economy, not immigration. Awaiting a new executive order on immigration, what we know and what we expect. And border closings, how the U.S. and countries around the world are taking steps toward reopening. All that's just ahead. Stick around. And here with me today, as always, are Teresa Cardinal-Brown, Director of Immigration and Cross-Border Policy. She's on Twitter, at BPC underscore T Brown. Hi, Teresa. Hi, Jordan. And Chris Ramon, Senior Immigration Policy Analyst, on Twitter, at C Ramon BPC. Hey, Chris. Hey, Jordan. All right, Teresa, Chris, thanks to you both for being here. So first up today, BPC and Morning Consult recently released the results of a survey showing that American voters want the federal government to focus on health care, treatment, and economic recovery, more than immigration actions in response to COVID-19. And that survey, which was fielded at the beginning of May, uh, was trying to gauge voters' responses to President Trump's executive order from April that temporarily suspended immigrant visas. So Chris, can you briefly go through the survey and its results? You wrote a blog post kind of breaking down the main points of that survey, wondering if you can walk us through uh, what you found. So as you said, the, the, we wanted to get a sense of where the American public is on the immigration actions that the Trump administration has taken uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. To just gauge what are they thinking? What are the priorities? Do they think immigration is something that the administration should be prioritizing at this moment? So we asked kind of f- five questions, but the four main ones that we pulled together for this blog post um, you know, kind of gave it an overall broadly is that immigration really isn't a priority for the American people. And although there might be some support for what President Trump has done on immigration, people are a little bit unsure about the impacts. So the first main finding is that we did sort of a rank order uh, question, kind of saying, you know, what are some priorities that the administration should be focusing on? And we had six options. The top first two options that ranked the highest among all the respondents was developing treatment and vaccines for COVID-19 and increased testing for COVID-19 as rank one and two. Um, With immigration, we had two options, shutting off immigration to the U.S. to preserve American jobs and allowing migrant workers to enter the U.S. to continue to support the food supply. That came in at uh, rank five and six. And that was the bottom of the ranking. So clearly people are saying we need to actually focus on medical issues and treatments in response to the pandemic instead of immigration. Now, what we did find is that, um, you know, the public, the the respondents did, uh, um, you know, a plurality definitely did support uh, President Trump's decision to suspend the issuance of new green cards for 60 days. We've been talking about this in the last couple of weeks uh, and there was support for that. But what was interesting is in a follow-up question, we said, you know, is it effective um, in opening more jobs for American voters? Um, it was actually pretty split. Uh, the, the, you know, uh, you had sort of um, 47% saying it's very effective or somewhat effective, uh, but then you had uh, 19% saying it's not too effective and 22% saying not at all effective. Um, and in fact, 13% of people said they don't know or they don't have an opinion. So there is a sense that, uh, you know, people support it, but they're not really sure whether it's going to be effective. Um, and I think what was interesting about this is that folks who are unemployed who responded to the survey didn't think it was going to be that effective at all. Uh, the people who thought it would be really effective were going to be folks who are retired um, or homemakers, that's what we found. So it's, a, it's an interesting little nugget to see the people who are unemployed probably aren't gonna be, get, or didn't view it as an effective measure. The last thing to note is, you know, we asked, based on what you know, do you think immigrants help or hurt the United States long-term economic recovery on COVID-19? Again, very much split, 28% said help, 27% said neither help nor hurt, 26% said hurt, and 19% said don't know, no opinion. So again, there's sort of this ambiguity about the role of immigration in, uh, you know, in the recovery for COVID-19, just as there's sort of an ambiguity about what President Trump is doing with the green card suspension. So I think that that's sort of the, the key takeaways from the survey and what I wrote in that blog post. Teresa, what surprised you from these results and what do you take away from everything that we found? Um, 
what was surprising to me is that when we asked the rank order of what the federal government should be working on in response to COVID-19, there really wasn't very significant difference between Republicans and Democrats when it came to where immigration ranked. Republicans and Democrats both ranked the immigration responses at the bottom. Uh, they both prioritized health uh, responses. Republicans, slightly more than Democrats, prioritized uh, reopening businesses and restarting the economy. But in general, immigration was not a priority, or didn't they didn't believe immigration should be a priority for the government, uh, regardless of party. And we know that there are pretty stark uh, partisan splits when it comes to most issues on immigration. But this was interesting to note that even Republicans didn't think that immigration should be a main priority or a top priority for the government in doing that, in, in responding. That having been said, Republicans were more supportive than Democrats of the president's executive order. Um, but again, uh, there were splits even among Republicans about whether or not it would actually uh, result in more jobs for Americans. Um, the biggest correlation was that those who thought that immigrants hurt the economy were most supportive of the executive order. Um, but again, you know, as Chris noted, uh, if you look across the board for at Americans, uh, that's an issue that they're unsure of. And, you know, there's been a lot of economic uh, studies, including some of our own, that show that immigrants generally are good for the economy. Um, but right now, when it comes to recovery, there's an ambivalence there. And I think that's something that we all need to take note of. The president may want to try to work in a lot of immigration issues uh, ahead of his campaign. It's one of the issues he knows and believes very strongly helped get him elected. But right now, a lot of the American public isn't very focused on that at all. And so it may not be as helpful to him as he thinks it does. OK, when we come back, breaking down a new expected executive order. Speaking of President Trump's executive order, rumors are swirling this week that Trump might issue a new order, this time addressing temporary work visas or guest workers. Now, we're recording this on May 27th, and we suspect that the order might be out by the time you're listening to this early next week. Um, so we're going to have this conversation based on what we know right now. So, Teresa, based on what we know now, what do we think might be in this order and who might it impact? So there's varying uh, reports out about what might be in the executive order. It could be as sweeping as halting all non-immigrant work visas uh, across the board uh, for a period of time, maybe 60 to 90 days, or it could be narrowly tailored and limiting certain types of visas. Uh, some reporting says that the administration may especially target um, the H-1B category uh, for higher skilled workforces uh, may limit the ability of foreign students to gain work authorization in the United States um, and curtail other types of visas. Uh, temporary visas for agriculture would probably not be affected, um, as well as certain um, other temporary visas for essential workers, such as doctors and nurses. But it might also restrict uh, work authorization for um, J-1 visa holders. Those are exchange visa holders that come to work in summer occupations in the United States. So think uh, uh, pool lifeguards and summer camp counselors and summer resort workers. Um, many of those activities, including summer camps and pools, have been closed down in, across America uh, due to the COVID-19. So it's not at all clear there'd be a lot of them coming in anyway. Um, but for some resort towns that may be reopening, they may need this labor force that could be impacting on them. Um, so we don't yet know exactly what the parameters of it will be. Uh, apparently, there's been a very big lobbying push by a lot of the business community on the White House to not make this a blanket uh, ban, uh, but tailor it to those uh, industries that they believe still need workers. Chris, these executive orders seem not to be about the coronavirus or its spread necessarily, but about the economic fallout from closing down the country to contain the virus. What economic argument is the president making with these orders and are they based in evidence? So the president has been making arguments saying that immigrants displace certain category of workers, um, you know, in the lead up to the announcement of the green card executive order and the executive order itself. Uh, for instance, he's been arguing that immigrants displace African-American workers and, and Hispanic workers who are already here. And that's, you know, that's, that's a major problem for a lot of communities in the United States. He tried to sort of make that argument. 
but the problem is that if you actually look at the industries that have been hardest hit by unemployment in this particular downturn, whether it's going to be a recession or a depression, what you see is that some these industries aren't ones that traditionally bring in green card employment-based visas or H-1Bs. 538 did a nice little analysis of of uh, the the increase in employment numbers between February and April. And what they found is that leisure and hospitality, um, other services and constructions were the three industries that were hardest hit by the downturn that we're experiencing right now. Um, if you look at, for instance, financial activities, uh, information technology, those are actually at the bottom of all these industries that they looked at. And when you think about it, the employment-based green card system is really kind of oriented more towards individuals of that have high abilities or have high levels of education. Um, and, the, and the H-1B as well, that that's also geared towards high-skilled workers. Those are individuals that don't tend to work in leisure and hospitality, other services or construction. Those are people who tend to work in technology fields, sometimes financial services, consulting, um, a whole host of industries that require higher levels of skills and labor market tests in the case of employment based green cards to determine that whether or not a job is all, it, you know, that the job and hiring of the, the non citizen doesn't displace uh, American workers. So basically, which is to say, a green card suspension or an H 1B suspension actually doesn't target industries that are hardest hit. And that raises questions as to whether or not this is simply a move to just simply restrict immigration, which the administration has been trying to do with the legal immigration system for the last uh, couple of years, um, as opposed to actually being a legitimate way to address unemployment in the American economy. All right. And Teresa, what does all of this tell us about the immigration system more broadly? I mean, doesn't the system already take into account economic needs in its design? Yeah. So as Chris mentioned, um, for uh, the two major categories of employment-based immigration, there is a requirement for a labor market test that's written into statute. For some of the temporary non-immigrant workers, there's a labor market test. But for even for the H-1B, there is an attestation. Employers do have to attest that they're not displacing U.S. workers, that they are paying at or above a prevailing wage. So those are the strategies that Congress has placed in statute to protect the uh, U.S. workers uh, from foreign competition. Um, and President Trump in issuing his employment, his immigrant uh, executive order, and probably if he does this with temporary workers, we'll use the same uh, rationale, is he said explicitly he didn't think that was good enough, that he is he is supplanting Congress's decision uh, because he didn't think that was strong enough given the COVID-19 economic uh, fallout. As Chris said, it's unclear that those suspensions are actually going to um, impact those who are most out of work. But there's there's additional things that make this particular downturn somewhat different than past recessions. Um, there was a study uh, in, in the Wall Street Journal that said 70 percent of those who are unemployed right now or furloughed believe they will go back to work when the economy recovers. So these do not these are people who do not believe that they are long term unemployed. They believe they'll be rehired probably in the jobs they had. And to that extent, that means they're not out looking for other work. So there are employers, the meatpacking industry is one that is heavily uh, filled with immigrants and has, been, has seen lots of shortages and very difficult time hiring U.S. workers. So I think it, it speaks broadly to this idea that perhaps, you know, there's a point to be made. And I think there's been definitely a lot of policy conversation about whether or not the labor market protections in the current immigration system are sufficient. Um, and, and certainly there are changes that can be made. Other countries do them different, do it differently. Um, but is the executive order the way to do it? And as our poll showed that we just talked about, a lot of Americans just simply aren't sure whether these kind of bans would actually save jobs for anybody in the United States right now. So again, um, I, I think that there's you know, more broadly, our immigration system probably should figure out how to be flexible and attentive to the economics of the country at any given time. Um, but blanket bans right now are not likely to achieve, you know, greater jobs for U.S. workers, given the uniqueness of the situation that we're in right now. All right. After the break, the status of border closings in the U.S. and around the world.
Last week, President Trump also announced new travel restrictions on Brazil, a country which is seeing a significant uptick in COVID-19 cases and deaths. Meanwhile, the United States and Canada announced the extension of the joint border crossing restrictions between the two countries, and the U.S. extended the restrictions with Mexico. And all this comes as the World Health Organization warned last week that countries reopening too quickly risk a second wave of widespread illness. Chris, we've discussed this all previously on the podcast, but do these border restrictions do very much to prevent the spread of illness? Um, what we've said pretty consistently here, um, not just simply Teresa and I, but um, uh, Dr. Anand Parak, uh, who's part of our healthcare program here at BPC, is that these restrictions are good for buying you time to prepare for a response to the incoming arrival of a, you know, of a contagious disease like COVID-19. Um, that is really what they're most effective at doing that. Um, they will slow the spread, but it won't completely, you know, stop the spread of, uh, of COVID-19, for instance, in this instance. Um, because, for instance, what the New York Times recently just reported, that uh, a large number of COVID-19 cases or individuals carrying COVID-19, for instance, came from Europe instead of coming in from China. Uh, and, you know, we did the travel restriction in China and that bought us some time, uh, but we didn't prepare ourselves to be able to deal with the incoming uh, arrivals of COVID-19 from Europe. And even with the restriction from China, that didn't necessarily apply to all U.S. Um, citizens who are coming from back from China to the United States. Um, so again, you know, it's it, it the the clearest thing, the clearest picture we can get from travel restrictions is that they are able to buy us time uh, to be able to prepare, um, but they that by themselves will not completely stop the spread of COVID nineteen or any other contagious diseases because people will you know American citizens can continue returning to the United States and because we may not be able to respond to where the virus might be coming from uh, depending on what part of the globe is affected and uh, travel flows from that part to the United States. Teresa, we've also seen reports in other parts of the world of countries slowly reopening their borders. Germany, for example, has called for opening the EU's internal borders by June. What does this say about the closures the United States is still doing? So, you know, it, it's the United, as, as you mentioned, the United States has extended the closures with uh, Canada and Mexico. The U.S. Uh, and Canada agreed jointly to extend the closures with Canada. And basically, it's a restriction. It's not exactly a closure. It's a closure to all non-essential travel uh, through the ports of entry. What that means is that people who have legitimate work or business needs to travel can still travel, emergency needs, trade can still flow, but uh, tourists and vacationers are the ones that are most impacted. People going to across the border to see family, for example, would be significantly impacted. Uh, personally, um, my family has a summer place in Quebec uh, that we usually travel to every summer, and these restrictions will prevent us from going to our summer place, uh, which has been occupied by a member of my husband's family for over 100 years every summer. So this is a big deal. Um, but that having been said, um, you know, as you mentioned, some countries are looking at reopening. Uh, and this is consistent with what we're seeing here in the United States about the push to try to reopen the economy. The economic fallout from the travel restrictions, from the social distancing, from stay-at-home orders and isolation orders has been significant around the world. And so everyone is trying to figure out how much they can do to reopen. Um, as Chris mentioned, specific travel restrictions with specific countries aren't likely to slow the virus in the United States. But this is really an extension of what social distancing is. The more interaction, the more travel you have, the more vectors for con you know, infection that, that's, that can spread anywhere. If you look at Europe, Germany um, has been looking to reopen at least partially to tourists. Other countries in Europe are fully open to tourists right now. Uh, Sweden, for example, the UK, Ireland, uh, the Netherlands are open. Uh, but the majority of Europe is still completely closed, including uh, France and Italy and Greece and Switzerland, Spain, Portugal. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's everyone's sort of trying to figure out um, what's the right balance between protecting people from illness and uh, allowing the economy to reopen? And so much of this is dependent, frankly, on how much people are willing to practice the medical countermeasures that 
medical professionals tell them, are you going to be wearing masks? Are you going to be avoiding large gatherings? Are you going to be maintaining that six foot social distance? The travel itself is a little bit of the problem, but the biggest problem is the compliance with those kinds of measures if people are going to be moving. Um, from an immigration perspective, again, travel and tourism is a multi-trillion dollar industry around the world. Chris mentioned some of the heaviest hit occupations in the United States are travel, tourism, hospitality, service industries, very dependent on the tourism industry. Um, so there is a push economically to reopen. Um, you know, what we're going to see is a lot dependent on the medical capabilities of countries. Um, are countries going to be wanting to treat tourists who get sick after they arrive? Are their medical systems going to be capable of doing that? Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions. And I think, uh, you know, what we're seeing a lot is a lack of sort of a united global response here. And every country is sort of figuring it out for themselves. So, Chris, the order by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention barring entry by undocumented immigrants along the U.S.-Mexico border was extended indefinitely recently. You've written about how the expulsions under the CDC order are now higher than the deportations under the Trump administration's other border programs. What does this indefinite extension mean for asylum seekers at the border? I mean, for all intents and purposes, we're looking at a situation where asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border probably has been shut down for a long period of time. Uh, you know, when you're looking at the data of Title 42 ex, uh, expulsions that we've seen of, uh, you know, over the last two months, Title 42 expulsions have now taken over, um, you know, Migrant Protection Protocol, also known as MPP uh, returns. Uh, those individuals who are sent back to Mexico to hear, to await uh, immigration court hearings for their asylum cases, as well as uh, returns for the Guatemala Islam Cooperative Agreement, uh, where we were sending folks back to Guatemala to seek asylum there. Um, of course, that agreement was suspended by Guatemala in mid-March. But if you look at the overall numbers, Title 42 expulsions have now taken over that as the primary method for removing that. So when this is the case, that this has become a program that has become sort of the definitive uh, mechanism to remove individuals, uh, especially including asylum seekers, from the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, it's highly likely that the asylum system basically is inaccessible at the border. And the fact that this is just going to be continuing in perpetuity, um, as long as uh, I believe the CDC continues to uh, renew it, um, it, it, there's very little chance that people might be getting asylum at the U.S.-Mexico border. Um, so this is, this is fairly unprecedented because we're looking at a situation where um, potentially individuals who might have valid claims can't access that. And, uh, and I think it's, it's definitely uh, something that I think is, has major implications for how the immigration system is going to function moving forward is whether or not we're going to have an asylum system. And I think more importantly, whether or not this measure actually is ultimately strong for our own immigration system, because we're not reforming the things that we need to reform, like the immigration courts or improving our adjudicative capacities to process asylum cases that led to the crisis over the last two years. Those problems are still with us. And unfortunately, by relying on something to just expel individuals back to Mexico or, or the countries of origin, uh, we continue, those problems will continue to fester as this policy remains in place. But obviously this has been a long-term priority for the administration and I don't see how they're gonna change this uh, during the pandemic uh, for the foreseeable future. All right, Chris, Teresa, I think that's a good place to leave it. Thanks to you both for joining me. And thanks to you all for listening. We'll be back in two weeks. Before we go, a quick reminder to subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or your favorite podcast platform. You can also find more information on all the issues we discuss here on the show at bipartisanpolicy.org slash immigration. This Week in Immigration was created by Teresa Cardinal-Brown and myself. The executive producer of This Week in Immigration is Teresa Cardinal-Brown. This week's episode was written by Chris Ramon and myself. Our producers are Chris Ramon and Yafat Tawahada. And our editor is Yafet Tawahada. The executive producer of BPC Podcasts is Ashley Swearingen. I'm Jordan Lapierre. Join us again next time on This Week in Immigration. <laughs>